So this is the final day for me. And so I needed to find a way to close, you know, the whole story. And so what we've done is we talked a bit about fluid dynamics. We talked about relativistic fluid dynamics in particular on day one, right? Talked about what goes in, why we need to worry about thermodynamics. Then we spent a lot of time talking actually about Newtonian gravity problems. So <coughs> there are two real reasons why we did that. One is they are sufficiently easy that I can do the calculations on the board, okay? Even though well, some equations got a little bit long, but we could do it, okay? And I think we kind of did it sometimes, but we did it well, sometimes we did it badly, that's life. And then there were some problems, some illustrations. I did the uh, tide as a demonstration of how we can use the modes of a star. As I said to you then, this is a problem I don't know exactly how to do in general relativity. Okay? I know I should. Yeah, I should do it because I need the precision of general relativity. But I don't know how to do it yet. So it's work in progress. So I couldn't lecture on that. And then we did the um, instabilities yesterday in Newtonian because the instability argument comes from Newtonian gravity, right? Again, it's a calculation we could do and we did it. But I wouldn't be able to, in a sensible way, lecture on the relativistic version of this because it's really messy, okay? It's technically very hard. And so, we were forced in this direction. But at the end of the day, we can't use Newtonian gravity because I've already told you there is a problem with the simple fact that in Newtonian gravity, the rest mass sources the gravitational potential. In general relativity, the energy sources the gravitational curvature. And this difference between rest mass and energy can be quite large in neutron stars. It's the 15, 20% that we typically talk about. Okay? And so this is, we expect Newtonian results to be 15, 20% wrong. Okay? But it's much worse than that. It's much, much worse than that because there are effects that exist in general relativity that are not present in Newtonian physics. One example being the rotational frame dragging, right? How a rotating body drags space-time along with it. And if you now think about the problem we did yesterday on rotating stars, clearly the modes of a rotating star will know that frame dragging is there. In fact, the frame dragging comes into the Coriolis force, if you want to use that language in relativity. And so it makes the force that drives these modes we calculated different. Okay? And then the worst problem of all is we have gravitational waves. So the gravitational waves change the boundary condition. So if you change the boundary conditions, the problems change, will, and any problem will change. That's why I can't do the tight problem because I don't exactly know how to build this. And so we have to do it in general relativity for precision or gravitational wave observations and things like that, any astrophysics. If we want to learn about the physics of neutral stars, we have to do this in general relativity. Sometimes we know how to do it, sometimes not. What I'm going to try to do now is I'm obviously not going to spend, be able to do this in 90 minutes and show you everything we did, but in general relativity, it's not going to happen. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to do three things. First, I want to show you a little bit what happens when you do perturbation theory, traditional perturbation theory in relativity for neutron stars. Second, I'm going to contrast that with how you do numerical simulations, okay? Because at some point in, you know, in this story, 
the problems will become too hard, nonlinear, whatever, that we need simulations. And I think it's important to understand how these two approaches are different and how they communicate with one another. Okay, so that's one which is that kind of low level just to give you the language. And then because I don't want to speak for an hour and a half, it's too long. I'm going to show you a movie. Interstellar. No, sorry, not, not that one. Uh, some, some other movie. And then we're going to talk a little bit about that movie. It's a numerical simulation movie. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit because I want to finish by telling you the kind of things that people are working on right now. Okay, so I think that that should close kind of nicely. Okay, so that's my plan. If it's a good plan, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out if we survive. Okay. Look up. No, come on. So let's think what we did. We looked at perturbations, waves in Newtonian stars. What are the ingredients? Well, the first ingredient is we need to decide what we're perturbing with respect to. What is the background configuration? Now, it will not surprise you that I will decide to work with a non-rotating star. You just simplify, as simple as possible. So I need a full velocity for the matter. You said it's non-rotating, it's not moving. I still need a full velocity because there is a clock. In relativity, the full velocity measures motion, but it also measures encodes how clocks work. Okay. So in essence, I still have this picture. Sorry, it's the third time, I think. Where well, A is the space time indices. So I still have this picture that fluid elements move in some shape in space and time. When this was Newtonian, this is just space, but this is space and time. So if time flows, it's still a velocity, okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down a metric. Uh, the typical choice here would be Schwarzschild coordinates. That's how this is typically usually derived. I'm going to do it a little bit different, but not much. I'm just going to open up the door for something different. So we need a static metric. And so it can be read off from a line element that has a timepiece, e to the new, say, some time coordinate t, and then some space piece, which I'm actually not going to expand. I'm just going to write it like this. I don't need to expand it. This is obviously going to be diagonal. You know the static metric in Schwarzschild coordinates and things like that. I want to write it like this because this could be in um, so Schwarzschild type coordinates. Schwarzschild. So then it then it would looks like something like e to the lambda the R squared plus R squared D omega squared. Okay, that's the two sphere. Okay. Or it could be isotropic. Where you have some overall factor e to the mu say, and it, this is flat. Now, the coordinates are obviously different then, right? <clears throat> and so I don't need to, for what I'm going to be doing, I don't need to commit, okay? And I think in the example that's set for this afternoon, at least one of them, I decided to go down this route. I did that because most of you have, probably haven't seen that, so it's quite unusual. But this is the way we do, typically do post-Newtonian expansions, because you have something that's then clearly flat, and everything lives here, and this becomes the gravitational potential, effectively. So it is kind of a nice way of doing this. <clears throat> Although it's, it's interesting, 
But this problem is a textbook problem for solving for the background like this. Probably all of you have seen it, maybe. This problem is very, very rarely discussed at all. And that's because this problem is much, much harder to solve numerically. There's no, there is a technical reason, but it's, it's just because of the way things come in. So this is what we're gonna do. <coughs> and now that we have a time coordinate and a metric, we can say that the four velocity has to be something, some constant, put the speed of light in so we get the dimensions. Well, doesn't matter so much, and some delta perhaps, with the time coordinate being, oh, actually you should put the C squared here. <coughs> if, I want, if I put in the Cs, okay? So this is, is X naught is CT, as the other day. And then <clears throat> you normalize this. So UA, UA is minus C squared tells us straight away that this A is e to the minus nu over two. So that's the gravitational redshift. And then we need the um, equations of motion. So what did we have? So suppose we have a barotrope. Then we showed that the energy equation and the baryon con conservation law were the same. So we have this equation, right? but now we know that this only has a time component. So that means this has to be effectively a time derivative. And then this is automatically satisfied because it's static. And then we had actually we had the uh, no, not like that. The projection it doesn't matter. We had the uh, conservation laws, right? The other, including this, but which led us to an Euler equation. And so the spatial part of the momentum equation, again, because this is only time dependent, it doesn't come in, or, or time component, it doesn't come in. And so what we end up having is something like GIJ gradient of pressure, which here, GIJ is just this guy, so the inverse of the, of the gamma. is minus P plus epsilon and then covariant derivative of the full velocity. The full velocity itself is irrelevant, but the Christoffels come into play. And then it's an e to the minute that comes out here. We're gonna look at how this comes about, I think later as well. It's a gamma i naught naught. So this is the usual thing in, in deriving the fluid equations, the tolman oppenheimer volkov equations that even though even though the full velocity is that for a static fluid, so nothing really moves, the convective derivative is um, u b grad b u a, whichever you like, comes in, right? And it comes in through the Christoffels. This guy only has time components, but that guy comes in. So we need to worry about the curvature. Okay. And if we work this out, which you're welcome to do, it's not very hard, I suppose. Yeah, this is a half G I A 
partial i e to the new. So only the, this piece comes in, doesn't care about this because <clears throat> this guy now is the gamma again, because there's an i here. This guy has to be, because it's static, it will be spherically symmetric, is the usual argument that the static method, if you start from spherical symmetry, derive the equations, only assuming symmetry, you find that it's static, it's the Birkhoff theorem. So this has to be spherically symmetric. So that means that the only component that can come in here is the radial component because it has spherical symmetry. It can only depend on, on radius, okay? And so this becomes the radial derivative here, which is one half. And then because this is now R, that has to be R as well. So this becomes the gamma R R, which And then the R. And if I put all that together, what happens here is I get the radial derivative of P. It's just minus P plus rho, P plus epsilon over two, there's a two from here. And then the R nu. So that's one of the pieces you need. That's a standard thing. And the interesting or not so interesting bit is that it doesn't matter if you use this piece or this piece. So say the, this part is the same. The Tolman, Oppenheimer, or Volkov equations kind of formally look similar. <clears throat> now we're not done. We need an equation for this. For that, we need to go to the Einstein equations. Okay? I'm not going to do that. <coughs> Instead, I'm not going to write down all of, all of it. It's not used, this textbook stuff. I'm not going to do that. What I want to do is I want to say, suppose, sorry, I'm not going to use orange today because last night there was a long discussion of orange being too political, so I'm not going to do that. Suppose there is a, perturbed velocity. So we jiggle this about a little bit. There's something moving and there are waves or something. What I'm going to try to do is work out how does this change? Okay. And I'm doing that hoping that by focusing on that simple equation, we're going to see how the problem gets harder. Okay. And we're also going to see some of the ingredients we need. And so we're going to do first this, and then a little bit on the metric, and then this. And then we're going to try to write this in a form that makes it more or less obvious what the Newtonian limit is, because that's where I have my intuition. I know how to solve that problem, so it helps me. If you can get as close as possible, right, then, then that's helpful. Because that at least gives me the impression that I know what's going on. Okay. So what do we do? We say we have a new four velocity. For the background, which I called U, let's call it U bar plus some delta U A. And now this is kind of something to take this to be small. You could put in a say epsilon to say keep track of what's small, but I'm just going to let the delta say this is small. Whenever there's a delta, it's small. Delta times delta is irrelevant. Okay. 
So then what we need is, we need to make sure that this whole guy is a four velocity. It has to be normalized. This one was normalized, but this one also has to be normalized. So we can multiply these together, right? But then I only know the upstairs one, so maybe it's helpful to me to rewrite this as some, some total metric plus perturbations, right? Times u a plus delta u a u b plus delta u b, something like that, right? Where this guy is the background we had plus a delta. And then you just crank this out, put this in, expand everything in these beautiful gory details. Let's do this. The symbol there, that means we connect up here. <coughs> crank out all the details. What comes out is first the background times UAUB that we have because that was normalized over here. It's minus C squared. That has to happen. <clears throat> and then we get a piece that takes the metric, perturbed metric or metric. Yeah, sorry, metric times one of these perturbations. Okay. The metric here, these, this metric is symmetric. So it's going to give us the same pieces. <clears throat> And in fact, it's going to give us something like this, 2C, P to the new half, delta new naught. And then we have a piece where the, this guy comes in, but U in the background only has a time component. So the only thing we can get is delta U naught, or is delta G naught naught. So what comes out from this is, e to the new c squared delta g c over zero. Okay. And we know this should be normalized, so it has to be minus c squared. Okay. Otherwise, <coughs> it's not a four velocity, okay. at least not proper. But that this is sitting here, and it's already sitting there. So what does that tell me? <coughs> well, it tell me that. The time component of the perturbed four velocity is entirely dictated by the time time component. Oh, I went orange after all. Or blue. So we see right, how the metric perturbations come in in the normalization. And this is kind of, and we see that the normalization condition doesn't involve the space components. Okay? So those are still free, but the time component here is completely fixed by the metric. <clears throat> And then you see that things like we need the cowling approximation. If you know, what does that mean in general relativity? Does it mean I kill all of this? You're shaking your head, but it could mean that. Some, most people take it to mean that. But that's a little bit funny because it means that you're killing this. And that's, you could do that, that's not a problem as such, but it's a little bit iffy. Or does it mean that you only kill the perturbations of this, for example, or some perturbations of this, maybe this? It's, uh, that choice is there. 
And there are choices there because in relativity, we have the freedom to choose gauge, which means we have four conditions that we can impose on the metric. And so we can impose four conditions on the perturbed metric. And so one of them could be say, I don't like this, get rid of this, right? So then I have three choices left. And so that this is one of the illustrations of why the relativity problem is suddenly much richer, the gauge freedom. Right? But my advice there is to say, look, let's keep the, you know, the sound of my laptop so I don't have to listen to myself. Talk here, it comes out there, it's kind of disconcerting. We might want to keep this gauge freedom for when we need it. And we are not there yet. This is not, this is not super complicated, right? Okay. <clears throat> so now, here we can do something that's gonna be a little bit naughty because it's totally misleading later. I wanna do it anyway, because I want to make the contrast. So <clears throat> we can ask, what does the perturbed metric look like? AB look like? Well, you can break it up into three pieces, okay? This guy, which I'm gonna define, I'm gonna call that delta alpha, is a scalar. So, that means in the language that we used before, we can expand this as a scalar, we can expand it in spherical harmonics, okay? <clears throat> delta G I naught, delta G naught I, which I'm gonna define as delta beta I is a all vector, I suppose. We know how to expand this because we can expand this using exactly the same basis that we used for the displacement vector before. So we know how to write this. Okay? So this is similar. I mean, similar object. Okay. And then we have the spatial part for delta gamma ij, which is a tensor. There we need to do more. Uh, actually, it turns out that so if you think of this as a tensor like this, the first guy here, there's a block there, two by two block. That's different, but these guys are actually also similar to this. So we need a two by two object where we need some new basis. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about that too much. So let's, with that in mind, let's proceed. So I want to go back over here and see where do we get to. So the first thing I'm going to do is a trick because I hate covariant derivatives. It's not true. But for di the divergence, there's a very nice trick that allows you to avoid covariant derivatives, okay? So the trick goes as follows. To rewrite this in terms of partials at the cost of putting in the metric de determinant. So 
So this is the trick. Uh, it's true because the metric determinant is not a tensor and it's defined in such a way that it provides here in the partials exactly the piece you need from the Christoffels here. Okay. You can work it out and you can look it up if you want. And from the point of view of understanding what the equations are, it just means I don't need to write out the Christoffels calculate them. I just have partial derivatives. Right? So if I want to do calculations on the computer, the computer understands partial derivatives. Right? That gives me the nature of the equation. So this is just a shortcut. Okay? <clears throat> now we've already seen this is automatically satisfied. Now it's even easier. There's a timepiece here. So this is a time derivative. This is static. So everything goes, and that's automatically satisfied. And now we're going to perturb it with the delta. Okay. So what happens? Well, the delta is an Eulerian perturbation. It commutes with a partial derivative. So actually, I can ignore this because it's sitting out front. It can't do anything. And so, let's see. I put the delta in here. If it, it can perturb this guy, right? That piece I have to have. And then it can perturb. If it perturbs these guys, then I know this is zero. So I know this is a time derivative, and that allows me to simplify everything a lot. So what comes out is the time component of the d naught derivative of n, because if I take these guys out of the derivative, then that cancels this. Sorry, delta. Plus. This guy, of course, the partial on root minus g n delta u a n. So because the background has certain properties, this perturbation simplifies a lot. For example, you think you get two pieces here, but you don't. You think you could get as many as Four pieces here, but you don't. So this looks quite nice. But now I know this is one over CT. And we know that this guy, the delta U naught will not pick up a piece. So I know, sorry, that's not right. We can separate the time piece here because we know the time piece from over here. Okay, so we separate that out. So then where are we? We are here. We pick up with this guy u naught. We have over there is an e to the minus nu by two c and then just a timepiece. Okay, so that's an e to the minus nu by two. Time derivative of delta n. Then we have this guy. If this is time, so A is naught, this is a time derivative, but these guys don't care about time derivatives, so they go through. So then that's just plus N, D naught, delta U naught. That doesn't necessarily vanish because it's this guy, and this can depend on time. Okay. And then the final piece is everything but the spatial part. With an I, say. There's the equation. Getting that. Okay. And then I know this guy because I have it here. It's a time derivative, but this doesn't depend on time that could. And then I've called this alpha. Okay. And then I can go. 
and here and say, well, so I can use this. I can keep that as it is. And so I can write then and I can multiply through by this e to the because it's the noise group. So I can write this equation like something like this. Plus e to the nu by two over that. And then I take root minus g and delta u i is minus e to the nu dt of alpha delta alpha. Now the question is, is that a good place to stop? Yes, I think so. So I could go a little bit further. I could actually introduce a covariant derivative associated with this metric and write that a little bit nicer. I'm not going to do it. It doesn't matter. Right? So we can stop here because what we see is that You can ask, where does the relativity come in? Okay. And you can see it comes in through the gravitational redshift piece. So because we're changing the time, right? It comes in through the metric determinant, and then it comes in through that time-time perturbation of the metric. Okay. Now, you can ask what happens in Newtonian gravity. Well, then something would happen here, but if you take the limit as we did, that's gonna go. But the live coupling of something that has time derivatives in it comes in at the higher level here. So that just says we have to be much more careful. So that was the simplest equation. And now we can spend five hours trying to do the rest. We're not going to do that. We're going to stop here. But we also need, obviously, we need momentum equation as obvious. And Need the Einstein field equations, right? Yes. So, since why, for example, in this one, when you have to convey this minus zeta, so you should have a term like delta n u a. Delta n u a, u a only has a time component, and it drops out. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, thank you, absolutely. Okay, so now, this is okay, you can proceed exactly like this, the equation gets a little bit longer, it's not horrendous, okay? The only thing that this, this guy picks up picks up this delta beta, okay? You can write it in many different ways. Then you see that, okay, I need the Einstein field equation, so I need to perturb something like RAB minus a half DAB R is by P is equal to force DAB. Right? So it doesn't look too bad. You put the delta on this, you need, so for example, you need Delta R, right? So now you have to ask yourself, what is the, what are the building blocks of the Ricci tensor? The Ricci tensor is built out of derivatives of the Christoffels and their products, right? So this goes like something like derivatives D of gamma plus E gamma gamma, right? And then the Christoffels are defined in terms of the metrics. 
right? They go to like metric times metric, or metric times derivatives of metric. It's easy to see that I would not be a wise man. I may not be a wise man anyway, but it would certainly not be wise to start writing these out on the board. I would say deriving these by hand as people used to do is not easy. It's a bookkeeping exercise. The calculations are straightforward, but to simplify it the right way is not easy. Okay. And then we need to pay attention to a lot of things. For example, Uh, because we know that the inverse of the metric is defined by this, right? So if you start do a perturbation on this, it gives you a relationship because this will vanish, gives you a relationship between the upstairs perturbation and the downstairs perturbation. And if you've done gravitation wave calculations, you know that this tells us that delta G A B, delta G A B goes like minus delta G A B, right? Something like that, okay? So that is a nuisance. Because minus signs are always a nuisance. And it comes from here. <coughs> and then the last thing I'm gonna read here is gauge. So I said, this gets really messy, but we have the freedom to choose four things. So the typical thing that people do is they choose something called Reggie Wheeler gauge because it was done in one of the very first problems of perturbations of black holes by John Wheeler and Tullio Regge in the 50s. And their motivation for this gauge was it threw away the highest order derivatives because they didn't like them. That's it, that's the motivation. And then everyone has slavishly followed this because you can go to their paper, copy down what the metric looks like and calculate. Or you could try to see, okay, look, this is general relativity, so are there gauge invariant quantities, right? So you can go and ask instead, are there quantities, variables that are gauge invariant? So I don't have to worry about this. And the answer is yes, there are. So the logic is typically something like this. This is perturbation theory. So if you have a quantity that vanishes in the background, so for example, here you see you don't have any G I naught pieces. It could be that these kinds of objects lead to gauge invariant quantities, maybe. So you can play with that. I'm not gonna do that either. I'm just saying there's, there's a lot here. These calculations people would typically do with computer algebra because frankly, everyone makes mistakes. There's this minus sign, there's all sorts of things. Uh, life is too short. Um, and so, you know, that's the way it is. Okay. So now we're going to change. So here's a 20 minute crash course in how to set up numerical relativity. So we still have these things. You can think of these now as the coordinates from before. Coordinates associated with the thing. But now, we introduce, as we like, a space like cut, a space like surface that covers all of space time. Okay? You can always do that. 
And then we say, there's going to exist another one a little bit later. And then because we're thinking of this as being later, so if this is space like the interval between them should at least have some time like component. So we just call this T, we call this T plus some DT. Now this T has nothing whatsoever to do with that T over there. We just call it T, okay? Because when we call it T, we think it's time. There's a very nice way a professor can confuse undergraduate students, okay? And that is to write down something like a wave equation where you swap over the space variable and time. See, if you call a space variable T, everyone gets really upset. Of course, it's just a name, it's just a label, and this is an example. Okay? But are you lazy? Okay. So now we want to somehow tell the computer how we march from here to here. This is space like covers all the space, and this is another space like slice. So oh, this kind of makes sense. Then now we have introduced a clock, right? Not the same clock as before, but it's a clock. And then we take, because this is now surfaces, this surface has a normal. So we call that normal N, and then we just say that is some minus alpha, actually very closely related to the alpha from over there although there's a different T, it's the same in spirit, the same thing. And then this is just the gradient of T as a field. Just think of this T as a, as a field that marches forward. You can work out this gradient that gives you normal to this surface. Okay. This is called the lapse. And it basically measures how fast do the clocks move forward. And then there is a duo to this gradient that says that T actually as a thing is alpha times this Na plus some beta. Okay. That beta is closely related to my beta from before. This is called the shift. And then what happens is these lines are coordinates. So how the coordinates, you fix down some coordinates, set some grid down here, there's a little mesh whatever coordinates you, you've got, then there you, you move, they stretch and squeeze whatever with space. So these lines track the same coordinate value, if you like. And what the lapse and the shift do is, the lapse is just the normal here. So this is alpha dt. And then from some coordinate line, actually, let's just make that blue. It's a specific coordinate line here, one point there, one point here, and then in the surface, the beta just tells us how do you connect these two points. Okay. So that's the idea. You can always do this, but it doesn't tell you the prescription for exactly how. It doesn't tell you what should these guys be. This is something you have to provide. Right? And then it turns out that if you do numerical simulations, there are some choices that are good, some choices that are complete disaster. That's experience. So I don't want to deliberate on that too much. But I want to introduce one more thing because I need it in a minute. 
you can also show that the gradient of n, which is turns out to be symmetric, defines something called KAB, which is called the extrinsic curvature. So that's a measure of the, not the curvature in the surface, but the other curvature, the other part of the curvature. This is just minus two, so it's a number, the lead derivative along n of this gamma AB, but this is the three metric, which is also defined precisely as over there when I put in the gamma. So I use the same notation so we can make the connection. They're not the same objects exactly. They have the same kind of meaning, okay? And then with this, we get the arnowit dayser misner form of uh, the space-time metric which is minus alpha squared dt squared. So you see that's why it's called the lapse. It tells you how the clocks change, plus the gamma ij coordinates dxi plus beta i dt dxj plus beta j dt. So the difference is what we were doing over there was a vibration effectively focusing on the four velocity, splitting and then projecting to get the three space dimensions. Here we're saying, let's set up the three space dimensions and then we use the normal to get the time. So this is three plus one, that's one plus three. They're both four, but in different ways. And so this gamma here is just the projection. Because this guy is normalized by this setup. Yeah. Okay, that's all I need, I think. So I want to map a fluid. So I know on the one hand, I've got the four velocity, right? This is still a real object. It's the same as over there. On the other hand, I'm now saying I've got a different time direction, right? So I'm gonna to choose to write this just like I did over there. I said it has to go like A times something or other some coefficient w has to a piece that's along n and then a piece that's not along n right so so that vanishes has to be like that right because these are my four this is only the new time direction or in a sense right and so i can always do this And then you can say, well, and it follows from this that n times u is going to be, that goes straight through, right? n times v is zero, so this is just this guy, but n is normalized here to, um, oh, actually I should write that down here. Normalize it, let's say minus one, like so, so we said C is one. That's because I don't want to keep track of the C's anymore. I'm, I've suddenly become a proper relativist. It took me five days, okay, but now I'm there. I, I have arrived. Okay, so if N times N is one, minus one, you see that this is just minus W.
Or if you want, you can now do the projection here and work out what W should be. We're not going to do that. That's not well, the bother with that. The other thing we can do is do U times U. Then now we know this guy. And so then we find that what this guy W is, it becomes because again, this is normalized, it's full velocity. This tells us that W is just one minus V squared minus one half, which you recognize from special relativity. This is just a Lorentz factor. It's just a Lorentz factor relative in this, in this motion. So this is just a trick. It says, look, I have a vibration over there with the full velocity. Now I have a foliation. Fine, let's live with that. But I can always use one to describe the other. I can relate them like this, right? That, that's a given. Um, should I, do I have to do that? I do, because I want to do fluid dynamics. This setup here doesn't give care one bit what the fluid is doing. This is entirely space time. But I told you on Monday, I really care passionately about thermodynamics, because I need to make sure the physics is right. But the physics lives here, right? So in my simulation, I need to keep track of this, otherwise, I don't do physics. And so I need to be able to swap back and forth between these two. Okay, so let's take a couple of minutes and just complete this by saying, what happens now if we want to work out baryon number conservation? So the pedestrian way is just to say, well, you just gave me this. I'm just going to plug that in. Right? And then I'm going to be lazy. So I'm going to give this guy a name. Let's call that N hat. So this is just the Lorentz contracted number density. If you have a box, it has got some density and it moves, it's going to be Lorentz contracted in the direction of motion. So the density is going to be squeezed by one Lorentz factor as you change one direction. Okay. So what happens here then, we can expand this derivative. We get this guy times the derivative of this n hat, we get spatial derivatives of this n hat times v. This is spatial with respect to this, right? If this is the naught component now, then this, these are spatial because of this. So we can write this like rad i n hat v i. And then we have the derivative on n, which is going to be minus n, I'll move that on the other side, n hat times grad i n a, grad a, grad a n a. But this is just the trace of this over here. Actually, it turns out to be minus the trace of this. This is n hat k. Might have missed. No, yeah, it's minus. There should be a minus somewhere. That doesn't matter. And now we're kind of done. If you want, this is the lead derivative of n hat the long n. But the lead derivative is built out of two pieces. 
is built out of this alpha and the beta, and you can keep on going. But the essence here is, I think we can also stop at that point. It doesn't really matter. I can tidy it up a little bit, but here is like a time variation, a log n. So in the usual sense, this tells us how the density changes in time. This is the usual divergence in space. So that in the continuity equation, here is the coupling to the space time. Okay. And then you can go through and rewrite, you know, either tidy this up and into, typically people introduce a different derivative, a projective derivative here. It looks nicer, but I'm not gonna do it now. It's in the books and stuff like that. Don't worry about it, it's just, a, just a flavor. Next, you need to do like TAB, it's gonna look like some epsilon hat or tilde some other bar maybe, NA, NB plus some stuff where even for a perfect fluid, because this is not you anymore, you get the stresses and things, so it's, it gets messier. Okay? But then you can work out the divergence of this and you get some evolution equations. And then you have the Einstein field equations. It gets messy. So the key point here is that I wanted to stress is the one I made a minute ago. When you do a numerical simulation, this is what you're doing. It's a different picture, okay? It's focuses on the space time, and then it, the fluid just lives in the space time. You get variables like this, okay? In order to do the thermodynamics, you need to figure out N, right? But to figure out N, you need to know how the fluid moves because you need the V, okay? So you need to evolve the system and work out and then figure out how can I invert the variable I'm solving for, which is this guy, so that I know both of these, okay? It's called conservative to primitive variables. The primitive is the physics. Conservative variables are what you write down in conservation laws here, okay? At every time step, you need to go from one to the other, okay? That's really expensive. And so in a simulation that costs a lot of time, okay? So I'm gonna stop at that point, stop writing and show you a simulation, right? And then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit um, because I want to illustrate how from these ingredients, I've only provided you like, this is like a recipe. I know we're not cooking, but if we were cooking, this would be the first line of the ingredients. I haven't given you the whole recipe. I certainly haven't given you the first you did this, then you did this, then you did, then you ate it, right? We're not ready for eating this yet. But I tried to give you a picture of what the building blocks are. What are the ideas, right? Then you can go and study. You need to work through some of these calculations correct all the mistakes that I made on the board. I'm sure there were thousands. Okay. Find all the mistakes in the textbooks. I'm sure there are thousands, at least if you're reading my book, I know. Um, and so, but you, you're better off doing that work for yourselves. Right? Now the man was gonna provide me with the screen, but he disappeared. So, I just start fiddling here. Maybe he will reappear. We'll see. Because I'm going to try to share this screen with the online community. I got to see my own bald head. That's nice of me. Okay.
Okay, so this is a simulation of two neutron stars merging. There's nothing special about it apart from I like it. And also, because we're at the, close to the end, it's a funny story about this. So I'm going to tell you the story. We had a new PhD student starting, and he wanted to work on neutron star mergers. So we said, go away and do this. Crash two neutron stars together. Uh, here's the stuff. Go, go and do it. Do it. Don't talk to us. One week later, he did it. One week. So that tells you, you can do it. You can do it. With the Einstein toolkit, everything is set up. You just need to download it, learn how to run it. You're done. You're in business. You're not doing research, right? We, but you can do it. And so he was very quick. It was a little bit annoying. He, professors don't like it when students are really quick. We need time to breathe and ignore the students, right? So we don't want you to be too quick. And we love it when you're quick, but, you know, we like to plan ahead. So then I said to him, because we've seen these movies from LIGO and things like when they do give presentations, how they have sound for the black holes, right? So I thought, being clever, I said, why don't you put sound on it? Because I said, I've never seen a neutron star merger simulation with sound. So then I went off to a conference in Santa Barbara, I think. And at the conference dinner, we were talking to some people. There was a ping on my phone. I had an email from the students there. Here's your movie with sound. So I played it. And I thought it was hilarious. Okay? So I showed it to people because I was like a proud father. Okay? Uh, the first neutron star movie with sound. It's not important. Okay, look, this is not the achievement, or it's just, it was a joke, okay? I just wanted to see it. I showed it to some people, and then I forgot about it. I put it on the hard disk and sat there. Last summer, I was in Aspen at a meeting. And the person that was present at the first meeting came up and talked to me, and she said, that movie you showed, I said, what? That movie you showed with the sound, can I have it? I said, what? And then she said, can I have it? Because we're writing this paper. She works at NASA on stuff. We're writing this paper on gamma ray bursts. Can I have this movie? It would be great for the press release. <laughs> Joking. So my joke is now coming back on me. I said, yes, you can have it. Of course, why not? So I wrote to the students, they can have it. So then they, we would put him in touch with the NASA press team, which demanded that the movie was nowhere pretty enough, there's no way near big enough or resolution enough or anything enough, so you had to redo it. And this is NASA's version of our joke movie. Okay, so I'm going to show that. It has sound, if I didn't mention that. So maybe you'll hear it. It's super long as well, and if it's too loud, you're just going to go up to it. So pay attention to things. The first thing is the gradually and spiral chirp, and then what happens after. That's what you should pay attention. That's the thing that I was thought was funny. Okay. So I'm going to start it, but then fast forward. Do we actually have some? This is going to go super loud, okay? And I'm going to fast forward a bit because it's really good. It might be a joke. So this is when the two stars crash together and that object starts to vibrate. Again, this is perturbation theory. This is the F mode in the merger. Okay? It sounds like a dying bird. And then the simulation starts going in every wind field. And it just sort of fizzles out. It's not worth very much, but you know, it, it, it was funny the first time. 
And now I just like it so much because it's also not the story that we did it, but it was picked up by NASA. So this is now a NASA press release where they made it all pretty. And you can see how it's zoomed out after a while because they decided we need to see more. Anyway, it just goes, goes, goes on forever. And it was very long because they needed it to be, for some reason, super long. Okay. Let's continue. Okay, so let's be a little bit more serious. So here's some snapshots of the kind of things we've been talking about, okay? What goes on in a neutron star merger? To illustrate the kind of how the physics is stretched. Okay? And I can also point to some of the things we know that we're doing badly, because that's the kind of things we want to fix. You can fix it. So at the top left, you have temperature and electron fraction. We talked about both of those. I had those in, as variables. Okay? At the merger, that when they first come together, and a little bit later. And they're not super easy to see, but you can see over here at merger, there's a black central region. So inside of one of the stars, temperature scale is quite cold, right? But there is a purple region around it that if you look at the temperature scale over here, is actually really hot. It's 10, over 10 MeV in temperature. It's really hot. It's about a factor of 100 hotter than it should be, okay? Then later you can see after merger, and that's it there, you reach yellow. Yellow is at the top of the scale. This is as hot as the matter in the Large Hadron Collider. It goes up in some simulations up to 100 MeV. Some years ago, not too long, people used to think that neutron stars mergers maybe reach 20 MeV, 10, 20. We reach 100. So the temperature goes up much more than we expected. And that means the temperature effects on the physics are much greater. And that means, unfortunately, that the nuclear physicists have to calculate the equation of state for us to higher temperatures, and that calculation is difficult. So there's a, a balance here. Okay? The lepton fraction you can see, perhaps, that it starts off, you know, fairly balanced and then nothing really exciting happens. But you can see that there's very sort of material all over at the merger and then it all disperses. Not very interesting. The density plots, this is what people typically show you. They're really boring. Movie, the movie is really, really boring. Because the density is really boring. It just says these are two dense blobs. They come together, they build a dense blob. Some slightly less dense stuff fizzles and just goes away. It looks pretty, perhaps, but it is really boring. It's important because the low density outflows are what gives you rapid nuclear reactions and give you eventually the observable kilonova optical signature because you get fast nuclear reaction, building heavy elements like gold and platinum, which journalists right, like because they think that we're going to create these things and get rich, right? And they like the fact that we say things like, you know, all the gold on the planet came from neutron stars crashing together, which may be true. And it is kind of amazing to think that that would be true. But it's no more amazing to think that perhaps all the atoms in our bodies came from supernova explosions, right? So we're all made of stars and our gold rings are doubly so, you know? But we're used to these kinds of things, okay? So one of the things here to pay attention to is the temperature. Because as I said, I think we know our simulations deal very badly with temperature close to the surface of the neutron star because of the way that we simulate things. In order to be able to keep the simulation stable and happy, we end up treating that low density bit badly. And apparently that means the temperature is way too high. But we've talked about thermodynamics, right? If the temperature is wrong by two orders of magnitude, I need to be worried that it filters through the rest. 
And I think nobody really knows yet how important that is. Right? And it comes into that conservative to primitive question, because now I've got temperature as well. I need to invert that back here and understand. So here is a plot of something I think is where people are today. This shows the deviation from chemical equilibrium, which we talked about, at merger and a little bit later. Okay? And this is useful because it tells us how important nuclear reactions may be. I remember I talked about this fast and slow. In simulations, you're in both regions and also in between. So where is this important? This is what we learned. So here, at merger, you see the first thing that happens is the stars come together. When they come together, it's like people falling in love. It's a, it's a violent chemical reaction. Right? Matter is hugely out of equilibrium. You see the very bright red thing. And then it's a little bit out of equilibrium all over the place. Some of it blue, some of it red. And then you have these lobes around the stars, but it's out of equilibrium because the simulation is wrong, because the temperature is wrong. Okay. Now, my problem is some of this out of equilibrium physics is real, and some of it is numerical artifact. But in this diagram, I only see the red and blue. I don't have a red that says, this is red that is incidentally wrong. This is red that's absolutely correct. Right? I have no way of telling the difference. So we're working on that. Here's later, you see now there's like two hotspots, the hottest part of the simulation, basically rotate around one another and there's some spiral arms, but this is much more controlled, but the matter is vastly out of equilibrium in some parts and not in others. And now you can go on and go forward and say, is this important? And you can show, I think, simulations from the last couple of years show that, and this is not too important for LIGO, say, today, but for a Cosmic Explorer Einstein telescope in 10 years' time, you're going to be able to tell the difference between the way we put the physics into the simulations today. People have different choices. People make different choices. You observe observations are going to tell the difference. We need to figure this out, and we have 10 years. So we're not there yet. Or you can do things like make um, a nuclear physicist, particle physicist, physicist happy. You can plot the chemical potential, so the density, against temperature and see where is the matter in the phase space. Right? And this is what people typically plot for the LHC and things like that. And here is the at merger. You see, this simulation goes up to about 70 MeV, so it's very hot. There's not much matter is that hot, but a little bit. So the dots are basically different points in the, in the simulation, just where are they? And then you see that how much mass there is is color coded here. So if it's yellow, there's a lot of mass there. If it's black, there's not so much. So there's not much of it is super hot. Most of it is about 20, okay? this band here. And then you can see how this evolves as the system settles down. So how it moves in, in the parameter space. And then you can go to your favorite nuclear physics, particle physics friend, maybe someone that knows QCD, and ask, are there going to be phase transitions to quarks? Where are they in this phase diagram? Is my matter there or not? So this is the kind of game that we're playing now. It, all of this is going to have to improve. Okay? We need to improve on the equation of state that goes in. We need to improve on how we put that physics into the models. We need to improve how we deal with it in the simulations. Okay? We need to improve on how we extract the physics at the end. And then we need to talk to gravitational wave people, about what chances there are of detecting different fine print things we see. There's a lot of work here to be done. Okay. This is not, you might think you read papers and think these are doing, these guys are doing not 
me necessarily, but others are doing fantastic, I think. There are people that are doing fantastic work on numerical simulations. A beautiful work compared to, you know, because I'm old enough to remember when we couldn't do this at all, right? I'm old enough to remember when we were proud that we could take two black holes that were so close to one another, you can't imagine, and let them go. And then everything crashed. Right? And now we can do these things. These things are fantastic compared to where we were some time ago. But we need to improve as much as that. And hopefully what we've done this week, if you're interested, is giving you a little bit of the flavor of the different things that go in. And hopefully if I've done my job right, I've also given you the impression that there is work for you to do. It's interesting work, it's exciting work because there's lots of physics. And I'm gonna stop talking because I'm gonna start sounding like a politician. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for listening. In the afternoon, as I said yesterday, why did we make it back in time? Right? Um, we're gonna do one problem probably, and then we're gonna open the floor for you. This is the end of this week. And I would very much have you ask my tutors questions. And then I would like to see what they say. He's scared now, but think about this. If you have any questions, ask them because I'm going to be leaving soon. So, okay, thank you very much. So any questions for Professor Anderson? Yeah, we even have time. Whoa. Okay, if not, then uh, let us formal. Okay. Yeah, good. Shoot. Otherwise, they just get an answer. That uh, make so sense. I have a question from previous class. So uh, when we calculate for F mode, yes. uh, then we consider incompressible fluid. Yes, so where rho, rho is constant. And when we calculate, when we take the general, where rho is not constant, we get to other mode like P mode and G yes. mode. Yes. So for Newton star, it's a code a centered, a central density nearly eight rho naught depending on its compactness and surface may be nuclear saturation density. So rho is varying. Yes. So we only see the P and G modes for- No, so, that, so in that sense, my calculations are misleading. I did the incompressible F mode because it's easy. I can go all the way to the end. Right? In, the, in the compressible case, if you notice, I cheated. I went to a local short wavelength calculation so the F mode is there, it's always there. It doesn't change much from the incompressible case. It looks kind of similar. Frequency is similar, but there is definitely an effect, as you say, because the density is not constant. So but that calculation you have to do numerically. I tried to stick to calculations I could do on the board. So there's more work to be done, right? Thank you. But there's a good question as it clarifies what we actually do. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> They're too hungry to think. No, they're sorry, we're not breaking for lunch. You get coffee. They need coffee to wake up. That's the thing. I need coffee to wake up as well, evidently. Okay, so let us thank Professor Anderson for uh, taking these classes. We're really thankful to you, sir, and hope it will be means coming to teach us again. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.